So I'm just delighted that we're here. Thank you for being in the service today, and thank you for uh, those who will be listening a little bit later online. And uh, so it's kind of nice. Uh, someone said to me this morning, we, we missed the service last week. We listened to you online. And uh, so that's, that's encouraging, just kind of builds my ego up, right? And makes my head bigger. And the last, the last thing we want is my head getting any bigger than what it is, yeah, we'll but uh, it won't, won't fit in the frame. That's right. Steve, be quiet. And uh, so, um, but, um, but anyway, just, it just encourages in every way. No, don't be quiet because I need you. Uh, so, but um, today we're going to continue our series of messages that we're in called 2019, A Year of Faith. And if there's anything that needs to be sparked within the body of Christ, it's just to have a faith that it exceeds ourselves in our living God and what God is able to do. And uh, so when we talk about sometimes why here in North America people don't want to go to church is because sometimes they, they just don't see anything that's different. And so, uh, but I think as faith walking people, if, there's any, if anyone should be a peculiar people, if there's anyone that should be a different people, it's us. And it's because of our faith in a living God. We don't point to a block of stone. We don't point to a block of wood to, to show where our God is because our God is not contained uh, by those kind of elements. But our God is a God of spirit and his power and his presence. And uh, just it's meant to be released and, and worked out. And of course, uh, his spirit is meant to live in and through us as his people. And if you profess the name of Jesus, the spirit of the living God is supposed to work through you. And you're supposed to be a part of his instruments to do his work. And so in 2019, I want us to hear at Spotlight Church. And I don't, I don't know what every other church is doing. Matter of fact, I had the Lord sort of check me in my spirit this week and say, you know, Mark, your, jo your job is not to make Spotlight Church like every other church. Your job is to be the church that I'm calling you to be. And I thought that was a great thing that, the, that, that I felt checked in my spirit, is that our job isn't simply just to follow the same pattern everyone does, uh, but our job is really to follow what God desires for us as a body. And, uh, and so we're going to do that. And I think to do that, you've got to be a people who walk by faith. And uh, so today, in our third part three of the series, I want to share with you a message about what it takes to really change. Because if we're going to be that kind of a church, if you're going to be that kind of a person that is a faith-walking person, if you're anything like me, there are some changes that need to happen within our lives. But what's it going to take to really break the, the, sort of the, the bondage and the barriers that keep us from making the changes we need to make in our lives? Because we need to make those changes. A universal desire of every uh, healthy human person is, be, is a desire to improve. Uh, you probably have a desire to get better. Some of you probably in your, in your physical workout, if you're into fitness, you're, you, know, you don't get into fitness because you want to get a bigger pot belly. You don't get into fitness because you want, to, you want to sag more. You get into fitness because you want things to be better and you want to, you want to make progress. You want to develop. You want to grow. And that's the way it is in our spiritual journey as well. <clears throat> Matter of fact, a proof of that is uh, people's desire to get better is, is that billions, literally billions, are spent every year on improving ourselves. Improving ourselves. Uh, there's products and books, there's advertisements, all that point to how you can have a better you. Well, in the body of Christ, I want us to be a better uh, as well. I want us to be more of a faith walking people to really know what it is, not just simply to follow the pattern of this world that Romans 12 talks about, but to really be better at being a follower of Jesus Christ. And, uh, and so all the things that these products and books and advertisements and the things of this world all those things, they last and produce short-term results. And there's all kinds of diets and things. That's exactly what they do if you follow them. They produce short-term results. But to get better, you really need to go back to the Scripture and say, Lord, what is it that you want me to be? What do you want your church to be? And to do that, you need to go back to the original. You need to go back to the one who has uh, encouraged us to be what we need to be. And so this morning, as I share this message, what I want you to do with this message, and I'll say it right up front, is I want you to think about the changes that you need to make in your life 
to be more of a faith walking person. And what is it really going to get? What's it going to take for you to make those changes in your life? And so let me give you from Romans chapter 12. And um, Romans chapter 12, what a great text. This is a great passage. And matter of fact, I'm going to go through it quickly this morning, but Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 12, I think has six predominant principles about what you need to do and what I need to do within my life if I'm going to make a change. And remember last week, I just talked about how the fact that people, you know, went through 2018, this is the way I am, 2019, this is the way I am. They never set goals, never get around to making changes. Well, I don't want that for us. I want us, like God's mercies, which are new every morning, I want us to have a fresh perspective and a fresh desire to be all that God wants us to be. But what's it going to take to break through the hardness? What's it going to take to break through the callousness? And I think Romans chapter 12 is just a powerful, powerful text that has some great principles that I'm going to share with you this morning. So grab the seat in front of you, hang on tight, and kind of go white knuckle a little bit, because I'm going to give you six principles about what it takes to really make a change in your life, if you're serious. If you're not serious about making a change in your life, I mean, go back and get a coffee, um, wander out the door, I mean, whatever you want to do. But if you're serious, these are six great principles that will just really make a difference in your life. Are you ready for these? Okay, three of you are. The rest will kind of tag along a little bit later. First of all, there's the principle of dedication. Matter of fact, when you begin to look in verse, uh, verse 1, it talks about, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies. And notice that phrase. Offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. The first principle coming out of Romans chapter 12 is the principle of dedication. You need to commit your body to God. Now, this is a very, very interesting thought to me here, and we'll get to a moment. But the first thing I want to draw out of this is that for change to happen in any area of your life, it's interesting to me that the place where you begin is you begin with the physical. The way God has knit our bodies together and our lives together, our body, soul, and spirit, it's interesting to me that when he talks about beginning to make change in your life, the best place to begin or the place to begin is to make some physical changes. And, and so you probably say, well, pastor, why is that? I'm glad you asked. Well, the body affects your behavior. How many of you uh, realize that when you got sore muscles and things are aching and hurting, your motivation is way down here. It's low. Muscles will influence your motivation. Your body influences your daily behaviors, your daily activity. And so when you think about making change in your life, maybe one of the areas and probably the best place to begin is to think about that principle of dedication, of committing your body and saying, well, physically, what changes do I need to make? Your body affects your behavior. Your muscles influence your motivation. Um, physiology affects your psychology. All right? Matter of fact, if I'm in a meeting and I get into these meetings that sometimes are dreadfully boring, um, if my district superintendent's listening to this, it's none of his meetings, it's all the other ones. <laughs> um, but a set of meetings that are dreadfully boring, I find that if I sit up and I begin to take some deep breaths, then when I change my physiology, my physical, excuse me, setup, then my, my mental attitude towards the meeting begins to change and I can engage better and actually be present and contribute to that meeting. And so our physiology affects our psychology. And God made our bodies that way. And so we need to be reminded of that. And that's what Romans 12 verse 1 is doing. It's reminding you that if you're going to make some change in your life, first change you need to make is to dedicate your body. And it starts physically. And, and as you walk through that verse, it says, Therefore, in the view of God's mercy, in other words, in light of everything that God has in store for you, he starts with your body. And everything I want you to do, and everything I want you to really enjoy of your Christianity, really, physically, some of us, we just never get there because our bodies aren't really being taken care of and prepared maybe the way we should. 
So he says, therefore, in, in view of all these things, in view of God's mercy and, and the power of this, he talks about, he says, um, to offer your bodies. Your body. And let's start with that phrase, your body. It's interesting to me, and I want you to notice this, he doesn't say, give me your heart. Isn't it interesting that in starting out this passage, he could have said, well, what about your heart? What about your soul? What about your spirit? But he says, I want you to offer your bodies. I want you physically to really start with your physical body, and I want you to offer your physical presence um, to, to making the change you need to make. And that's why, to me, I, I think it's important, as you, even as we think about church attendance, there's something incredibly significant about really being present physically within a service, both for yourself and for those that are there as well. And so our bodies is where it begins. It's interesting, he doesn't say, present your heart. He says, present your bodies. And so, uh, of course, the Gnostics, they teach that your body is evil and bad, but that's not what God teaches. The Bible teaches that God created our bodies. Our bodies are very much a part of our lives and therefore a part of the changes. If we're going to make changes, we need to include our bodies. And our bodies are His property. Uh, and if they belong to Him, we shouldn't vandalize our bodies. We shouldn't treat them poorly. The Bible tells us that Jesus paid for our bodies. The Holy Spirit lives in us. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so we should think about our body. The body is our body is connected to Christ's body, how we can physically, even by you being here this morning and seeing your smiling face, it just encourages me. The body of Christ benefits from that. We're connected to one another. And one day, my body will be resurrected, the scripture talks about. And so, so we need to think about that when we think about making change in our life, is think about how you're offering your bodies. Let's look at the word offer. The word offer in that text uh, is it talking about something that's forced or voluntary? Really, what's happening here is it's really voluntary. God is asking you to offer your body in a voluntary way towards, towards uh, making change and being the person you need to be. So let me give you this principle today. No one can force you to change. Now today, no matter who I am and no matter who the pastor is up front, no matter who is around you, no matter who your spouse is, no matter who your boyfriend or girlfriend is, no one can force you to change. Um, now, now, apart from that, I mean, I'm about to do some weddings and in, in moving into the summer months, but um, some of those weddings are designed for you know, the bride to make some changes in her soon-to-be uh, uh, husband. Uh, you know, they put the order of service together. You ever come across that where in, in a wedding order of service, it has the aisle first and the altar, then a hymn. And uh, I'll alter him. And, um, and so, so some of those changes happen, but really no one can force you to make changes in your life. And folks, this morning, as my church family, I realize I can't make you be the person of faith you need to be. I can't help you to believe in a God of miracles. You've got to decide that yourself. If there are bad attitudes that need to be put away, if there are things in our character that are hurtful and harmful, if we have fits of rage and temper in our lives, I can't make you change those things. I can't do anything about it. But if you offer yourself voluntarily and say, God, I want to change, I want to be different, then we can make a change. So that's the first law of change, is that change is my choice. You never change until you choose to. It's not going to happen. And so if we're going to be those kinds of people who are making the changes, to be the people and to be the church that God wants us to be, it's your choice. If there's some things that need to change in your habits, in your life, in your thinking, in your attitudes, whatever it may be, it's your choice. You need to make that choice. Change is your choice. God never overrides it. He, if you decide whether you're going to be that believer that you need to be or you're not. And so you need to decide that. And it's interesting, he calls us a living sacrifice. As we offer our bodies as living sacrifices, it just kind of reminds me of just what is so true, is that as sacrifices, we can crawl off the altar because we're still alive. 
God is an override in us. You can still ignore God and walk away from Him. Uh, your conviction is to your it, it'd be to your own uh, detriment if you do so. But as a living sacrifice, we got to decide: Are we going to stay on the altar and be the person God wants us to be and give Him everything, or are we going to crawl off of that altar and be something else? Then the scripture in verse 1 talks about spiritual act of worship. And I'm going through this quickly today. But I think there are three ways to offer your body as an act of worship. You, you offer your body by cleansing your body. Detox. And of course, we cleanse our bodies physically. But I think we also cleanse our bodies in other ways too. It's amazing the number of people today who are professing believers who daily surrender themselves to pornography. Speaking of gentlemen. Pornography is, is something that has become very casual within the body of Christ amongst the churches. And it's really incredible. And so there needs to be a detox. We need to cleanse ourselves from those things that really are harmful and hurting us. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates the body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. Some of us maybe need to detox our bodies physically. So we do it by cleansing our bodies. We do it by caring for our bodies. Um, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 29 says, No one hates, or shouldn't, hates his own body, but lovingly cares for it, just as Christ cares for his body, which is the church. Then the third thing we can do is that we can control our bodies. Um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 4 says, Each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable uh, to the Lord. And so today I want to encourage you as you think about what's it going to take to make some changes. First of all, it's offering your bodies. It's that dedication. Second principle come out of this, and I'll go quicker through the rest of them, is, is the principle of consecration. Or concentration, I should say. As you concentrate, as you refocus your thinking and the way that you think, then you can make some changes in your life. But if you don't change the way that you think, you will never make the changes. That's why people will say to me, oh, I can't do this. Or, oh, I, I was, I, that's just the way I am. I, my, I, I was like that all since my childhood. That's just the way I am today. I just say what I think. I just do what I want to do. And I just think that is the biggest excuse. That's all it is. Because when you begin to change your thinking, you can change your behavior. And so the scripture teaches in Romans 12, verse 2, it tells us all about how we can be transformed. And how do we do that? We do it by the renewing or the changing of our minds, the power of that. And so the principle here is, what are you concentrating concentra uh, on? What are you focusing on? And so um, Romans 12, 2 says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. Whatever gets your attention gets you, period. Whatever gets your attention, it gets you. And so if something that you're focused on, it's probably, if you're focused on it mentally, you're, it's probably going to have you in other ways as well. Scripture also goes on and says the word conform. Conform is simply a word that when translate means to copy everyone else. Is that the way we live our lives? I think when I was studying this text, that's why the Holy Spirit checked me about the kind of church we're going to be. You know, we're not getting our own permanent facility or looking to get our own per permanent facility because every other church is doing it. Is that why we're doing it? Isn't that why the, uh, Israel wanted the king? Because all the other big kids had a king, so they wanted a king. You know, is that why Israel got a, a temple? God didn't ask them to build the temple in the Old Testament, but they got a temple. Is it because all the other kids had a, ki a temple to house their God in? And see, sometimes we're so busy conforming and copying everything around us that we never stop to think, Lord, what is it that you want me to do? What pathway do you want me to go? What kind of person do you want me to be around in, in my life? And so the word conform is, do not conform, do not copy everyone else. And so often we let others shape our lives today. And that's why if I simply did what my mom or my dad did, if I simply did what my older brothers and sisters did, I wouldn't be here in church today. I wouldn't be a pastor. I wouldn't be a lot of things. But when I let God begin to 
make me into the person he wanted me to be, then my pathway became different. Let me stop here. How many of us today are simply conforming to everything that's around us, whether it's a good pattern or a bad pattern? We're just simply following a copy of what maybe someone else is doing. The words there, any longer, really speaks to our habits. You know, do not conform any longer. In other words, you've been doing it. It's a habit in your life. You've been, it's been happening all along. And, and I wonder how many of us are simply carrying out habits we've always been doing. And, and so what's it going to do? What's it going to take before you change that habit? And of course, ultimately, we're following the pattern of this world. And so do not conform and do not follow the pattern of this world. The second law to change that we need to be aware of is to change, um, to change my life and to change your life, then I need to change my model. My model. Who's your mentor? Who is it you look up to? Who is it you model in your life? Who, who gets your attention? Who are your partner, your friends? You need to choose your models carefully. Over 20 times, Jesus said in his three years of earthly ministry, he said, follow John, right? He didn't say that. I'm just messing with you. He said, follow me. Even the Apostle Paul, six different times, he said, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Folks, we need to think about who is our mentor, who is our model, who are we copying around us? And so we we need to be careful about that. And then be transformed speaks of uh, uh, the word there is metamorpho. If, if I'm correct in putting it out there, it means to go from a caterpillar to a butterfly. In other words, Christianity is a complete, a complete transformation that should happen in our hearts. When you become a Christian, you don't simply add a little leaf onto your life and say, hey, that's my Jesus side of me here. All right? When God gets a hold of you, he changes you completely inside and outside in every way. That's why that word metamorpho is so important. It's like a caterpillar becoming a butterfly. It's a completely different uh, change in a totally new life. And so how does all that happen? Folks, it happens in our minds. It happens in the way when you go to work and your attitude towards your colleagues that you're with. Whatever is penetrating and working through your mind, it is changing you into the person you are today. But if you're going to make a change, then you need to realize that you need to also begin to change how you think and how you focus. And so to do that, you need to put off before you put on. If you want to put on the things of God, through put off some old things. Maybe today, even here within this service, even within us as a handful of people, Maybe we have deceitful desires. Maybe we have impure thoughts. Maybe we have attitudes. Maybe we have uh, a hatred or hurt towards other people in our lives, and we've learned just to live and conform to that pattern because we've always done it. Scripture is saying, don't do that any longer. Change. Don't let that change ruin you. Let God change your attitudes. And I've said this before in one of my previous messages, that attitudes are like diapers. They must be changed occasionally. Or else they stink. I just have this passion that I do not want to be, I don't want to be the believer I was when I got converted when I was 16. If I was still that, kind of that same believer back then, I wouldn't be here today. I want to be growing and alive in my faith. And I think the world needs to see a body of believers that are passionate and alive in their faith. Amen? Amen. Great. Number three, and you're looking at your watch as I look at mine, evaluation. You need to humbly assess your current state. Let me say this quickly. In this principle of evaluation, the number one barrier to change is pride. I don't need to change. I'm perfect and fine where I am. Pastor, just leave me alone. The number one barrier to change is pride. I don't want to admit that I need to change. I don't want to have to go to somebody and say, I'm sorry. My pride keeps me from doing all the things. I'm not going to do that. Romans 12.3 says, Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment. 
in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Do not think of yourself more highly than you should. The third ingredient of change that really is important is change needs, you need to be humble, needs humility. Admit that you don't have it all together. (laughs) I almost admit that on a daily basis. I don't have it all together. I don't know all the answers. I don't know, if you ask me, I don't know what God is always thinking. I don't know the answer to that. We need to be willing to evaluate our lives and humbly assess where we're at. And if in that assessment we are struggling or hurting, then we need to be honest about that. We need to have sober judgment in our estimate of ourselves. We need to think about the faith that we have and the measure of faith that we have. If you were to measure your your faith today and, and pour it into a container, pour it into a cup, would you have one cup of faith? Would you have two cups of faith? What would your measure of faith look like today? When's the last time you engaged your faith? And do you have enough faith to really help you to be different and to make the change? A principle in Scripture that is taught is that limited faith equals limited future. Hear me when I say this. Limited faith equals limited future. Unlimited faith equals unlimited future. So the third law of change, I can only manage what I measure. I can only manage what I measure. This morning, God is calling us to be that door of faith to the city of Stratford. We will never, ever be that door of faith if we don't follow a different pattern. And we go back to the original, which is Jesus himself, and let our pattern be modeled after him. Number four, the principle of cooperation. You and I were never called to walk alone. It's amazing in this individualistic age that people like to isolate themselves. I'm hurting, so I'll get by myself. I'm mad, so I'll get by myself. Isolation, isolation, isolation. And Satan loves that. Because in isolation, you won't make the changes you need to make. You won't follow the pattern you need to follow you will become a candidate for brokenness. But in community and in cooperating with others, which is why the scripture talks about in verses 4 and 5, that we are bodies of many parts, and we all have a special function. And as a matter of fact, if I can say it so clearly, if Spotlight Church is going to go ahead, then we all as a body, we need to function together, and we need to come to the table with that special function and say, here's my special function You can count on me. And if we don't do that, we will never function and never be that healthy whole body that God wants us to be. And so there's the principle of cooperation here, that you and I are to never walk alone. And the the fourth law of change here is that change requires community. Change requires community. Um, You know, whether you like me or not, we're supposed to be together. I love you, but whether you like me or not, that's... I won't lose any sleep, but, um, but we're supposed to be together. And sometimes, you know what? Sometimes you know how hard it is sometimes to get along with other people in the body of Christ? Yeah. I can tell by the look on your face, you know. Yeah. But we're meant to be together. I need you. I hope you need me. We're meant to be in community. But if we try to walk alone, if we try to do our own thing, if we try to be individualistic, we will never succeed in being the person that God wants us to be. God works in community over and over again. That principle of cooperation is is played out in Scripture. Romans chapter 12 tells us the fifth principle. It tells us about the principle of affirmation. Affirmation means I need to fill my life with something, and that something is love. I can fill my life with hate. I can fill it with indifference. I could not give a hoot. But Scripture tells me that I need to fill my life with love if I'm really serious about making a change. What good does love do? Love invigorates. It revitalizes. It renews. It refreshes. It heals. It uplifts. It strengthens. It energizes. It empowers. Love is incredible. 
And that's why in Romans 12, verses 9 and 10, it says, just don't pretend that you love others, really love them. Isn't that great? you got to really love them. Just don't put on the air of loving somebody. You've got to find a way to really love them and to love each other with genuine affection. And, uh, you know, here at Spotlight, uh, since I've come, I have intentionally started hugging people. All right? Some of you are like hugging, hugging a, an ironing board, you know. Some are really enjoy it more. But I believe it's a way, of, in a simple way, of showing deep appreciation and love. Hopefully it's not inappropriate. But I think we need to find ways to show genuine appreciation and ways of honoring each other, as Romans talks about. Fifth law of change, if you want to change in your life, is that love is not optional. You must love. God has wired the universe this way, is that when we, want, when we help others, when we reach out in community, when we love others, God helps and you. If you want God to speak into your life, then you need to reach out and speak into other people's lives. And healing will come back to you. Wholeness will come back to you when you realize you must fill your life full of love. There should be no room for hate. And the final principle from Romans 12. Isn't it great? I love this passage. <laughs> Romans 12 is the principle of motivation. Of motivation. Romans 12, verses 11, 12 says, Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor. In other words, don't die, folks. Don't lose your spark. Don't lose your fire about what it means to follow Jesus, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Even, by golly, when it gets difficult, do it. And so one of the ways that we need to really think about changes in our life is we need to nurture, and I'm choosing this word carefully, we need to nurture our enthusiasm. A writer, Emerson, said this. He says, nothing great is ever accomplished without enthusiasm. I agree with that. And it's easy in this day and age to lose our enthusiasm. It's easy to get caught up in the negativity. It's easy to always find something that's wrong instead of finding something that's right. But when I speak of enthusiasm, I'm not talking about positive thinking. It takes more than positive thinking. If you're going to make changes in your life, if you're a positive thinker, great. But I'm not talking about that. It takes more than positive thinking. And this is the, the final law of change that I want to give you today. Is keep your spiritual fervor. If you want a change in your life, you need to keep that fire burning. You need to keep that spark there in your relationship with Jesus Christ. And how do you do it? it tell, Paul says three ways you do it. You be joyful in hope. How many of us have hope for tomorrow? How many of us want to lift our head off of the pillow in the morning? No, we have those days where you think, why am I even getting out of bed? But you know what? Be joyful in hope. Be patient in affliction. And you know what? You're going to have hard times. You're going to have difficult times. But can you be patient and trust God? And finally, be faithful in prayer. It's amazing how we like to solve things by speaking to our best friend we are texting somebody, oh, I'm going through a hard time, just text somebody. And God's going, why don't you just text me, talk to me, be faithful talking to me. That's what we need today. And so if, um, if we're going to make changes in our life, we need to nurture our enthusiasm. We need to keep our spiritual fervor. And I've got to be honest with you as I finish this message out this morning. Where has the fire gone? Where is the spark that says every day, it says, Lord, thank you. Thank you for another day I get to serve you. Another day I get to walk with you. In North America, now if I go to South America, I don't need to worry about spiritual fervor. Matter of fact, I like to tell them to tone it down a bit. Not really. But here in North America, somehow if there is a dial, I'd like to just crank it up and say, come on, where, is God, where are God's people and their fervor and their passion that just sets them apart as a peculiar people? 
this morning as I share these things, I'm trying the best I can to help us here at Spotlight Church to be the people and to be the church that God wants us to be. And the only way we can do that is for you to choose, even this very day, to be the person that you need to be. And to do that, maybe there are some changes. There are some changes you need to make. Let's stand in closing. As our worship team comes to sort of close out or help us to close out the service today, I just feel God speaking to me and encouraging me just to ask you, bow your heads, no one looking around, and I'm doing this intentionally. Don't look around. If God has maybe put his finger on something you need to change in your life today, and just as a response to this message today, you want to put your hand up and put it back down, just a way of showing me, no one else around you, Show me so I can remember you in my closing prayer. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And I can put my hand up as well. Things that I need to change. Great. Spirit of the living God, you've seen the hands that have gone up. And, and Lord, I even feel that there is a, a rawness here within the room about really saying yes to you, Lord. I need to change. And so, Father, today, help us to not let pride stand in the way. Help us not to give in to the wrong patterns that we're following and conforming to. But, Lord, help us to follow you and to surrender to you and to fully trust you today. And for the hands that have gone up, I ask that you would speak into their lives and help them this very day to make the changes they need to make so they can fully be engaged, and be the person you want them to be. Not what I want them to be, but what you want them to be. And so, Lord, just shepherd them, speak to them, and guide them, and mold them as they put off the old habits and the old ways. Lord, help them to put on you, Christ, and to clothe you, clothe themselves with you, Lord. So, Father, this day, help us to sense your presence, your power, guiding us and leading us in the days ahead. And Lord, my prayer today as a church that you'd help remind us that our goal is not to be patterned after every other church in our community, but God, help us to hear your voice and to follow your example and to follow what you want for us in the days ahead. And we will give you all the praise as we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.